welcome to this special episode of Frequency Matters, the RF and Microwave Update Series. I'm Pat Hindle, and I'm here with my co-host, Gary LaRude, and we have a special guest today, Liz Roosh, General Manager, Quantum Engineering Solutions at Keysight Technologies. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Pat, and thanks, Gary. Happy to be here. As the leader of the Quantum Engineering Solutions Group, I wanted to start off with the fact that most people really struggle to explain you know, what a quantum computer is and how it works. Could you give us a quick tutorial? Well, thanks, Pat, and thanks, Gary. I'm really excited to have the opportunity today to connect with your readers and listeners with respect to quantum and explaining how these systems actually work, as I've been learning myself over the past several months. I find that a picture is worth a thousand words, so let's maybe start with a view of what these things look like from the outside and then uh, move inside. So I've put together three slides here to illustrate some basic concepts. The first is what does the computer look like, again, starting from the outside. So on the left, you can see a photo of what a quantum computer might look like at a trade show. Very clean and very crisp. On the right is what it might actually look like in the laboratory. And what you're looking at here is actually the quantum computer in the center, which is located within a cryostat or a cooling mechanism for this superconducting computer. And everything else that you see in the photo is actually also related to the cryostat and the computer's cooling system. But let's take a look under the hood and see what's going on inside. First, you can see that we have the processor located at the bottom of the cryostat. Again, I mentioned this is a superconducting system and these qubits therefore need to be very cold to operate. At this level in the cryostat, we wanna ensure good connectivity to the chip minimizing any sorts of crosstalk and any errors. And we want to have very uh, precise connectivity to the rest of the computing system. Now, you might ask, how cold does it actually need to be? In this case, we're operating the processor at 10 millikelvin, and that's quite a bit colder than even outer space. In comparison, at a higher level in the cryostat, you can see it, outer space level would be around 3 kelvin. And as we move all the way up to room temperature at the very top of the cryostat, we're worried about things like system level performance, system stability, system synchronization, and scalability as the number of qubits in the system increases. Customers place things like our qubit control system at the top of the cryostat as most test measurement equipment operates primarily at room temperature. The second thing I'd like to highlight is all the cabling that you see running up and down from the top of the cryostat. And this is uh, connecting the qubit control system, again, to the processor at the very bottom. Along this path, customers are using many filters, attenuators, amplifiers, and circulators in the path. And there could even be several cables per qubit for control and readout. So creating something like a 50 qubit system could have over 120 cables or more in the system. All these cables, of course, need to be calibrated so that the overall system level, we can focus on things like having a very low signal to noise ratio, very good phase noise, and low latency. So customers are using things like network analyzers to aid in the calibration process, and often modular network analyzers, for example, in PXI, are particularly useful due to the number of channels that they're trying to manage. So, we might ask ourselves, what makes a quantum computer different than a classical computer? In a classical computer, we have bits that we refer to as ones or zeros. In a quantum computer, you have things that are called qubits, and these can actually be zero and one at the same time. We describe this characteristic of a quantum system and these qubits as being in a state of superposition. I personally like to think of superposition as a case where the qubit can be at a high energy state or a low energy state. And we sometimes mathematically see it represented as something like this block sphere that you can see on the left-hand part of the slide. Depending on the stimulus that the qubit is receiving from a microwave pulse, and these pulses could be stimulating qubits in the range of two to 20 gigahertz, they could be at a high energy or low energy state. When the qubit collapses, you can actually think of it entering a no energy state, and it stays there until it's re-stimulated again. Now, you might also hear that it's not just about the number of qubits that you have in your system, 
but the power of how many that you can entangle with each other. And this is the concept of entanglement. Entanglement is where you can manipulate the state of one qubit and directly have it affect the state of another qubit immediately. This is another tough concept to wrap one's head around, but it's where the two to the power of n uh, quantum computing advantage comes into play. And it's a critical term for, uh, for our quantum customers to, uh, to understand. So one might ask, why are we hearing a lot about quantum today? And what's changed? Quantum's actually been something that's been under investigation since the early 1980s. But there's quite a bit of buzz about it in the past, I'd say, 12 to 24 months. The first thing is that there are major uh, companies that are making announcements of breakthroughs in the quantum space. We heard from folks like Google in late 2019 that claimed quantum supremacy with one of their computer systems operating at 53 qubits of processing power. And we've heard uh, customers like IBM say it's not about number of qubits, but it's about quantum volume. And quantum volume actually takes into account not only the number of qubits, but things such as uh, crosstalk, coherence, gate fidelity, calibration errors, about 10 other aspects other than just the number of qubits themselves. And IBM is touting something like a computer with a quantum volume of 32. So a lot of big names uh, having some technology breakthroughs and making announcements in the quantum space. The second reason why I think we're getting a lot of attention in quantum today is that there's a tremendous amount of investment, both government investment from US, China, Europe, and rest of world, as well as commercial investment from these major companies. And last but not least, venture capital is flowing into quantum as well, uh, funding a lot of startups investigating different types of technologies. Keysight itself has also been investing in quantum over the past several years. We acquired a company called Signadyne several years ago, and they were involved in the quantum space, not only with modular AWGs and digitizers, but something called HVI, or their hard virtual instrumentation technology, which helps out a lot with some of the pre precise timing and triggering that's required in these multi-channel systems. We also recently acquired a company called Labber in late 2019, and that adds uh, our software to our software portfolio and increasing our capabilities to help customers go up the quantum stack for instrument uh, control, for measurement, making actual quantum measurements, and data visualization of those measurements uh, of those experiments. Why is quantum computing market important to the test and measurement companies besides just the funding? So I think there's a lot of uh, very interesting challenges that customers are needing to solve in the quantum space uh, from design to test. So uh, we're engaging with customers with our EDA tools, for example, at the design level of how do I create this, this qubit itself? And also what materials are used for these qubits? As I mentioned, I talked about superconducting a couple times, but there's different types of qubits. There's superconducting ones, there's trapped ion, um, there's spin. You can think of this as we have different uh, transistors that are all made with different semiconductor processes, right? Could be CMOS, could be gas, gallium arsenide, et cetera. So there's uh, a lot of design tools in, in both the qubit uh, design as well as materials research using our device modeling tools for, uh, for qubits. The second thing I would say is that there's, as you saw, a tremendous amount of challenge in the cryostat itself around the cabling and control of these systems. So test and measurement lends itself well to that in terms of stimulus and response. In the quantum world, we refer to it as control and readout. So it could be things like AWGs, uh, arbitrary waveform generators, and digitizers. These qubits are basically stimulated by microwave pulses. They could be in the two to 20 gigahertz range. So often you have up converters and down converters that are involved uh, as well just to uh, do the qubit control. And last but not least, I'd say uh, a lot of calibration, right? Of again, all those different, uh, different paths. As the number of qubits increases, you've got a lot more uh, paths that you need to calibrate and, uh, and worry about. So you talked some about the acquisitions you did and also a little bit about the architecture. Can you give us a little bit more details about how RF and microwave fits into quantum computing? 
Yeah, so starting again with uh, with cubic control, that's uh, that's really where we start at the top of the, the cryostat. So uh, our systems today are in a PXI-based architecture due to the, the multi-channel nature of these requirements. And we're able to put in uh, AWGs, digitizers, customers in many cases are putting in modular network analyzers to do calibration as well into these systems. Uh, additional equipment that I haven't talked about are things like uh, signal generators. Now these could be acting as LOs um, for some of our uh, up conversion stages. They could also be used for driving some of the amplifiers that are in the chain going up and down the cryostat. You also see uh, things like DC sources uh, for stimulus. There's also instrumentation like our ALFNA system uh, for 1 over F noise because these qubits are very sensitive to phase noise and very sensitive devices. And uh, last but not least, a lot of software. So our Labber uh, software helps customers with instrument control, measurement setups uh, designed with kind of a, a physicist uh, designed uh, mindset as a, the approach to software and the experiments and uh, also data, data visualization. So Labber uh, plays a role as well as the hardware. And uh, I'd say in future, uh, we'll be introducing some things like our quantum IP libraries, which will give customers even more control at the FPGA level of some of their experiments. So you mentioned that quantum computing will probably complement current traditional computing. Uh, when do you expect it to be commercially available for general use? Yeah, so good question. Um, I don't think quantum computers will be in broad-based use, I'd say, anywhere in the next uh, five years or so. It's still very much a research topic for customers. But having said that, you can actually rent time on some quantum computers today. Uh, both IBM and uh, Rigetti have put their computers online for customers to use or rent time on in the cloud. I think that'll be a common use model, uh, at least as the industry gets started here. And then there's other folks uh, like uh, Microsoft and Amazon that are also offering cloud services for quantum using a variety of hardware platforms. But I'd say in the, in the immediate term, it's still very much a research field. You know, another quantum term that you might hear, um, we talked about quantum, uh, quantum volume and quantum supremacy, but another term you might hear is quantum advantage. And that's where you can actually have both a quantum system and a problem that you're trying to solve that's, uh, that's relevant, that the combination of those two is, is still a bit of ways off for us. So Liz, are there are other applications besides quantum computing that quantum theory is good for? Yes, yeah, so Keysight is actually engaging with customers in uh, three segments of, uh, of quantum. We classify it as quantum computing, which we talked a lot about today, uh, but also quantum communications and quantum sensing. And what's interesting, if I pause for a minute on quantum communications, is that some of that actually um, may be in the, in the foreground today because it's using a lot of classical technologies. We find customers using optics, uh, for example, in this space. And uh, the key topic here is around QKD or quantum key distribution. You hear about people worrying about, will all of our passcodes be cracked or will RSA encryption be broken? Um, but in this space, we are, uh, again, working with customers on, uh, on some things that are more classically optical-based than RF and microwave-based. In the quantum sensing space, uh, this would be, say, more in um, aerospace defense, or you can see precision navigation or mining applications. Um, there is research being done here as well, but I would say that that's more an uh, application layer um, that will, will connect to a quantum computer in, uh, in the long term. Well, Liz, thank you very much for the uh, excellent tutorial on quantum computing. I definitely understand more about it now than I did when we started. And it sounds like a real exciting uh, new area opportunity for Keysight. So best of luck to you and your team.